Good morning, everyone. Greetings and welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning. I am Kira Epstein, the program coordinator for the New School at Commonweal. Today, we welcome back Anna LaPay as our host in the last of three conversations in this year's Roots of Resilience in an Age of Crisis series that we co-presented with Real Food Media. Anna will be in conversation with Leah Douglas, Ligia Gualpa, and Suzanne Adeli to hear stories of solidarity across our food chain. Anna and I want to welcome you and to thank you for participating in the series. We have had five other amazing conversations. The topics were land, seed, water, soil, and sea, speaking with uh, some very inspiring people working in these areas. You can find all of the conversations in the series on our website. That's tns.commonweal.org or on our other uh, media outlets SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Thanks to Ken Adams behind the scene helping us as always. Leah Douglas, Ligia Gualpa, and Suzanne Adeli, welcome to the New School at Commonweal. Thanks, Kira. Thank you so much. And yes, welcome to you three and welcome to all of you who are tuning in uh, wherever you are. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, as Kira said, my name is Anna LaPay and on behalf of the whole team at Real Food Media, we are thrilled again to partner with Kira in the new school. And for this uh, webinar, we're just really thrilled to have all of you here to join us in this conversation about solidarity and food workers. I feel like uh, never uh, has this been a more important uh, time to be having this conversation. If any of you have worked in the food industry or currently work in the food industry? Have you bartended? Are you uh, a former or current farm worker or farmer, barista? Have you bagged groceries, waitress? One of the things we know about food workers is not only they currently are about 21 and a half million people in the US, but that many of us have been at one time or will be at one time a member of uh, the workers along the food chain. So if you wanna share any of that in the chat, please do. Uh, I want to just take a minute to give another special shout out to Maisie Richards, who's on the line uh, from Roundwater Design, who'll be crafting uh, an image uh, that will be uh, an artistic rendering of some of the themes that we'll be hearing today. So thank you, Maisie, and we'll be sharing that out with all of you. So before opening up to the conversation, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background about the three incredible people you'll be hearing from and a little bit of context for this conversation. Uh, as I mentioned, I feel this is a particularly ripe moment for this conversation as we continue to navigate this pandemic and the economic turmoil that it has wrought for so many of us, and particularly for food workers who continue to be on the front line of this crisis. Uh, but of course, even before COVID, food workers in this country were disproportionately vulnerable in the workplace. Uh, the food workers in the US are among the lowest paid uh, workers. Uh, they tend to do some of the most dangerous jobs in our economy. And you'll hear a lot more about that today and what we can do about it. Uh, but I also feel like this event feels particularly timely. We planned this many months ago, but it feels particularly timely in this moment, uh, this week, where uh, we're sensing incredible popular enthusiasm for workers, worker justice, for unions in this country. We all just saw uh, the first unionized Amazon facility come into being. And we are seeing polling that's showing us that public sentiment for unions hasn't been as strong as it is today since 1965. Yet despite this popular support, only 6.1% of private sector workers are unionized. 6.1%. Uh, at the peak, to give you some context, 1953, almost 36% were. So you can hear, you'll be hearing a lot more about what, how to explain this connect, disconnect between popular sentiment and what's happening for workers in the workplace uh, uh, when we get into conversation with our speakers today. Um, so I'm thinking about all of this context and more as we enter into this conversation with these three incredible women you'll hear from who will be sharing their wisdom and insights about this fight for food justice for food workers. Uh, we're excited to have with us veteran journalist Leah Douglas, whose 
groundbreaking COVID reporting for the Food and Environment Reporting Network covered the illness and death among meat packing plant, meat packing plant workers uh, during COVID, uh, bringing to light their suffering that otherwise would have remained hidden. We're also joined by Lihia Walpa of the Worker Justice Project. Founded in 2010, the Worker Justice Project is a New York City-based worker center that educates, organizes, and fights for better working conditions and social justice in the workplace. It has a base of more than 12,000 members and um, helps to organize those members to stand up for uh, better pay, better working conditions, and for solidarity. Finally, we'll also be hearing from Suzanne Adeli, co-director of the Food Chain Workers Alliance, which launched in 2009 and whose work lifts up the voices of food workers and helps build the movement for greater dignity in their work. So couldn't imagine uh, three people who I'd be more interested in having this conversation with than you three. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, with that quick introduction and some context setting, I want to open it up now for this conversation with the three of you. And I'd love to dive into the conversation as we get into these themes of food, labor, and solidarity uh, to begin by having each of you um, share a little bit more with us about what brought you to the work you do at these intersections of food um, and food workers and social justice. Can we start with you, Leah? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Really happy to be here. Um, well, I mean, I would say that uh, Food system workers have always been um, a major focus of my work. Um, I have a background in an academic background in sustainable agriculture, and the issues of, um, of food system workers are really central to, to the work that I did academically and then um, in my early career. So when I became a journalist, um, I was always aware of the issues that um, were facing food system workers, um, whether wage issues, immigration issues, and so on. Um, and it's it's perpetually an undercovered, underreported issue in the media landscape. Um, so wherever possible, I've tried to um, really bring those voices in. And and I think one of the things I've learned along the way is that you know it's it's a long term project, a long term process to build trust and build connections with organizations, with workers, with unions, um, so that you know there's um, an understanding that the the stories that those workers have to share will be represented. In the media, and that's that's not always a given, um, and not always a relationship that's that's easy or, or fast to build. I think a lot of reporters um, are, you know, putting in the work now more than ever to try to build those connections, and and that's always been a, a big priority for me. Thanks, Leah. And I, I know you and I have talked about this in the past, but it still is always so shocking to me how few. Uh, significant media outlets who would have the resources to have a labor desk or uh, multiple reporters on a labor beat don't have that, don't have that in place and, and aren't providing that critical coverage. So thank you for the work uh, that you did. You'll talk more about the reporting that you did at the Food Environment Reporting Network. And as you all see in the chat, Leah um, right now is um, a reporter at Reuters. Um, Lehi, I'd love to turn it over to you to have you just share a little bit more about br what brought you into this work that you're doing uh, uh, with your organization. Um, and then we'll circle back later in the conversation to hear more about your organization's current campaigns. So Lihi, yeah, so, well, thank you so much for having me here. So my name is Ligia Walpa. I'm the co-founder of the Workers' Justice Project, uh, and which is a worker center um, that, uh, based in New York, um, we do workers' rights organizing, and the work we do is just very personal to me as a, as a migrant woman that was raised in the South Bronx by a day labor, uh, former day labor father and a garment worker. Um, and... And for the past decade, we've been organizing and empowering workers to transform and win essential protections. Um, and that's exactly what brought me up to um, start organizing app delivery workers right after the pandemic who were left without a safety net, without jobs. Um, the only fastest growing industry um, that really was able to keep them working, paying their rent, bringing food to their tables was app food delivery work um, through the app platforms. Um, and But noticing that this big multi-billion dollar companies um, profits grew by more than 200% and realizing that app food delivery workers were earning um, not even minimum wage, $7.87, 49 were experiencing um, 
um, percent were experiencing uh, accidents and just knowing that this is one of the fastest growing industries that um, actually are not only poorly paying, but treating workers as disposable workers. Um, and out of that work, um, we're proud to give birth to Los Deliveristas Unidos, which is a, a one of the largest, fastest growing app delivery worker collectives that are determined to rewrite the rules of the gig work and bring dignity um, to the food delivery work in our city, um, in actually one of the uh, most powerful cities of the nation where um, app delivery workers are literally um, coming and testing new business models. Um, and we're building a movement to kind of redefine the future of um, gig work and um, the food system in our city. Thanks, Lihia. And I really, I want to come back to that a little bit later in the conversation, because of course, one of the other big context setting qualities of this moment is exactly what you all are on the cutting edge of, which is this battle over determining what the future of work looks like. And there is, and um, we'll circle back to this, but, you know, there is this attempt by those app-based companies to really uh, rewrite labor law uh, and to really redefine uh, their res company's responsibilities to their workers. So I really want to circle back to that. And um, it's one of the, 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 pieces of the work that you're doing that is so, uh, so critical. And really, you said it, you know, New York, what happens in New York City is really setting a lot of the precedent to what will what these companies are expecting to see around the, the world, literally. So thank you for that. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and uh, Suzanne, we'll turn to you next. What, if you want to sure. share. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, you know, when I think about my background, um, I realized that uh, I, I've always kind of been at the intersection of food and labor. My, my parents were both farmers uh, in the Middle East or West Asia before they be, became economic migrants and came to the U.S. and actually worked as food workers. Um, and my, my father was a rank and file union leader. Um, but it, it wasn't uh, a very sort of like quick move into that intersection. You know, I was a middle school teacher for many years, became a community organizer um, in my own com community. And, you know, much of the work that we had been doing was related to economic justice and immigrant rights. Um, and that led me to go to law school, where I also had a very visionary a uh, kind of clinical teacher who combined labor and, and immigration law uh, and human rights law together, um, seeing the intersections of that. Uh, but still, you know, uh, my experience had been that, you know, the labor world was still very male, uh, white and labor, like white and, and male. Um, but I, I slowly began to develop a network of friends who were all women of color. Uh, organizing locally for workers' rights in, in New York, in Chicago, in different parts of the country. And, and they were kind of the ones that encouraged me to um, continue to pursue that. And that led me to going abroad, where I was actually working in the auto industry. Um, but, you know, you know it, it, it makes a lot of sense because essentially, like I was working in different capacities and, and had been in, in places in the global south, like India and Egypt and elsewhere. And, you know, essentially what we were trying to do was sort of like reveal the supply chain and how is ex exploiting workers and, and then think about what it means to build like cross national solidarity. And it's very much what we try to do in, in the Food Chain Workers Alliance. Um, and so um, when I came back to the United States, one of these women from this network that I built recommended the Food Chain Workers Alliance. And it, um, and it, it, it became sort of, at first, I didn't know how meaningful it would be for me um, because, you know, at the time I was abroad, you know, it was also um, being in North Africa and in South Asia, kind of also learning the importance of our food systems and the struggle to protect our food systems. So that intersection uh, was also there. And then, you know, as I've been in the organization, you know, I'm be I'm beginning to see how important our approach, the supply chain approach, is. Uh, you know, to be able to like build the kind of 
world that we want for workers. Um, and I'm also really just inspired by how resilient and, and militant our base has been. Um, and I love to work with my coworkers. So I'm very committed to it. Thanks, Suzanne. Well, I want to stay with you and then we'll um, we'll come to you, Leah, to, to talk more about your work in New York City and then to you, Leah, to put this in the context of the reporting that you've been doing on food workers. But to stick with you, Suzanne, to just, um, I, I loved hearing about what brought you into this work and the, the um, the, the road you took to bring you to the food chain workers. And I thought maybe we could stay with you to have us get a little bit of that um, kind of the, the, the forest level picture of food workers in this country uh, and what you see from your perspective at the, uh, at the Food Chain Workers Alliance. Uh, and um, you mentioned as part of your pathway, your experience in law school and this connection between labor law, human rights law, immigration law, and uh, how you see those intersections playing out in the kind of advocacy work you guys are doing at the Food Chain Workers Alliance. Sure, of course. You know, um, in the past couple of years, you know, as uh, we've been um, engaging uh, with you know, uh, our allies and the public around how COVID has impacted food workers, you know, it was always really important that we begin by saying that, you know, the uh, the impact is really um, due to pre-existing conditions in the food system that you know that existed before COVID, and um, you know, and we all know that the food system is profit-driven. Um, it's it it is um, marred with corporate consolidation and special interests like from the American Farm Bureau to the National Restaurant Association to the big meat industries. Um, and, you know, and they have support within, you know, the political parties. Um, so, you know, that political landscape coupled with, you know, what you were saying earlier was that, you know, the food industry is the largest industry in the country. It is uh, the largest workforce in the country, and it also has the lowest median wage um, and the highest rate of food insecurity of any workforce. Um, and, it also has uh, has been uh, the industry that has been perhaps you know one of the most exploited, if not the most exploitative, um, and that manifests in, in various ways, including oh, sort of the all the health and safety vulnerabilities that we've seen under COVID, for example, but existed um, you know way before that, um, as well as uh, you know high rates of wage theft, high rates of gendered racialized discrimination and violence you know, in, in various industries. Um, and, you know, and, you know, we could actually could talk about what those conditions look like for a long time, but, you know, Mart, like another sort of uh, reality that just kind of, it's it sort of parallel to that is, is that, um, you know, the right to organize is, one that is continuously sort of being violated, right? And we're talking about, um, you know, there's a desire for unionization, uh, but there's there's a lot of challenges towards unionization. Even though, you know, we're, we're seeing kind of, um, you know, an increase in worker sort of organizing and um, and a lot of victories in, in that field, particularly within our bases as well. Um, the fact of the matter is, is the right to organize is still a right that's being violated in multiple ways. And I'm not just talking about in terms like legally, directly in the law, right? I mean, of course, we know that there are certain sectors that uh, just don't have the right to organize as it is. But what we're, when we talk about the right to organize, we really talk about the multiple ways that that right is undermined, right? Through retaliation without accountability, um, through, uh, you know, um, relying, for example, on temp work, in, like, for example, in the warehouse industry, um, to, and as you're saying, this sort of re relying very heavily on, um, uh, on, on immigrant labor, right? Um, and particularly then exploiting um, the fact that many workers are either undocumented or, or part of guest worker programs um, as ways to kind of continue that, that um, intimidation and, and power over, over workers um, to sort of prevent that kind of organizing from happening, um, you know, in the workplace. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, what we've seen is multiple, multiple examples of workers sort of being able to, um, you know, succeed in organizing for the rights despite, despite that reality. Well, I think that is a great segue to uh, turn it over to uh, to hear about the Worker Justice Project work, the work you're doing, Leah, because as you mentioned, there are these incredible barriers. I was just reading a, a Human Rights Watch report from a couple of years ago that estimated that more than 55,000 workers annually are fired for trying to organize on the job, which of course is illegal. <laughs> but as you mentioned, Suzanne, there's very little accountability uh, to when, that, when employers uh, take that kind of retaliatory behavior. So uh, I think you really set up well, like just the incredible barriers to organizing. And yet, as we'll hear from Lee and X, like you all in New York City, from my understanding, have just had such, uh, have, have been building such incredible worker power and solidarity. And so I'd love to turn it over to you, Lee, to have you share with us um, some of the work that you've been doing, particularly uh, as you started to share a little bit already, the work you've been doing just in the last couple of years as COVID has so much, has so impacted so many uh, people in your community. So we'll turn it over to you next, Leah. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Anna. So, um, I, and, you know, the economy is shifting. I think that's the new reality we need to understand. You know, um, in New York, after COVID, uh, New York City became the home of more than 65,000 uh, delivery workers, um, mostly immigrants, um, Black and brown New Yorkers who have been subcontracted by um, the majority by three main multi-billion dollar tech companies like Grubhub, Uber, DoorDash, and many others, right? Um, while these companies' revenues have grown more than 200%, uh, which I mentioned earlier, over uh, the time of COVID, right? Um, deliveristas were experiencing the most inhumane working conditions, as I mentioned before, um, through our uh, first um, X-ray industry research we did, we, we find out that Deliveries were making seven dollars and eighty seven cents an hour. Um, you know, eighty three percent of workers were being denied access of a bathroom in the twenty first century, right? Like a basic thing as a bathroom. Um, and as I said, thirty percent of them were saying that we're having payment issues. Um, we're not seeing our tips. We're not seeing the payment. Um, and for this reason. Um, right during the worst time and the darkest time of our time, um, um, in March of 2020, um, Workers' Justice Project, along with brave, courageous leaders, decided to build one of the largest and most diverse um, collectives of app delivery workers. Um, and they together decided to bring to the streets more than 4,000 deliveristas to march, organize, to rewrite the rules of the, uh, the food delivery industry, right? Um, and they did it. They secured this over past year, six basic labor protections, right? Access, not only access to bathroom, um, the right to have a living wage, the ability not to be charged fees in order so they can get paid, right? To have more control and power of how far they wanna travel um, the to be paid a delivery back because most of these workers um, and our members are mostly um, don't have rights as workers. They have been completely excluded from basic protections. We one of the most powerful things with deliveristas is that they 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 organize, they build a organizing infrastructure, and they want basic protections as a first step to start regulating one of the fastest, largest um, industries, which happens to be um, food delivery work on the gig economy. Um, and we did it. But right now in New York, deliveristas are, are reimagining what the future would look like, right? Um, as essential frontline workers, they, re they recognize, the city recognized that they are essential to the city's recovery, right? They are the ones who kept New Yorkers fed. They're the ones who kept um, New Yorkers safe during the pandemic. They kept, they kept restaurants open during the pandemic. Um, they're vital to, to the, kind of the economic and local economy recovery, right? Um, and one of the most important things is that they're, they wanna make sure that when we think about recovery, 
Um, we're thinking about ensuring essential workers like food delivery workers have not only rights, but the opportunity to have worker representation. And this is why is it important that organizing we're doing in New York, because workers are saying, Yes, we are now relying on the food delivery work as a way of survival. Yes, we're working within the gig economy. Yes, we are completely excluded from worker protections, right? Um, yes, we don't have worker representation. Let's build a new model of organizing. Let's, let's not just this, not, not this, not only disrupt, but transform this new economy that we rely on to provide to our families, um, to keep our local economy going. And this is what exactly we're doing in New York. Um, and Los Deliveristas Unidos, um, it's, it's not just a movement. Um, one of the pathways that they're taking is to build a really new roadmap of what organizing would look like in the food delivery industry, in the gig economy, um, and most importantly, also building infrastructure that meets the needs of food delivery workers who are doing this, this work in an environmentally friendly model on bikes, on e-bikes, right? They're, they're also um, are doing, they did their research and they want to shape what infrastructure looks like in our cities, right? And most importantly, they also want to make sure that they raise industry standards so they can transform this industry in a profession that is treated with dignity and respect. That's what they're doing in New York. Well, thank you for sharing all that. It's so, um, so inspiring and uh, exciting to hear. And it's also, as you said, I mean, that here we are in the 21st century and your uh, members had to battle to be able to have access to restrooms on the job. Um, so I want to turn it over to you next, uh, Leah, to bring another voice into this conversation. So you come into this conversation as a reporter, you've been covering the food sector for a long time, and we wanted to bring you in in particular because of the of really critical work you did reporting on another sector that was really impacted by COVID, another sector that also saw record profits, and another sector whose workers were really, really uh, impacted on the front lines of uh, putting food on the table and on the front lines of really being impacted by COVID, which is uh, the meatpacking industry and meatpacking workers. So I'd love to turn it over to you to have you share a bit about that project that you worked on, uh, what you uncovered in your reporting, why you felt like it was important <laughs> to report on it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, just Anything else you'd want to share about that work that um, you know really brings in another critical part of the story about uh, food worker, food worker organizing? Yeah, absolutely. So, so during um, the the first about two years of COVID, I um, put together a, a map and a database that was attempting to capture as many um, outbreaks of COVID in the food manufacturing and processing sectors that I could. So that included um, farms and farm workers. Um, Meat packing workers and and what I what I called food processing, which is a broad sector that includes everything from uh, apple packing to salad manufacturing and and so on, all those other foods that you go to the grocery store. And um, the project started in March of 2020 um, when the the Fern newsroom, like every newsroom, had had kind of turned its full attention to COVID and was sort of scrambling to wrap our heads around what was going on. And I had started hearing reports of outbreaks at um, at food manufacturing facilities and was Googling around like, you know, list of outbreaks. Um, and uh, I couldn't find any. And, and I thought, well, maybe a good story to, to put together, you know, a spreadsheet of, you know, in, in March and April, how many outbreaks have there been? And, and this will probably wrap up pretty soon. So um, that'd be a good one story to do. And uh, of course, I, I started working on that and it quickly became clear even in April of 2020 that this was not going to be a situation that went away quickly. And actually the, the scale and magnitude of um, how COVID was affecting the food manufacturing sector in particular um, was way beyond what was being reported and, and what I understood and really what anybody had, had publicly been able to wrap their heads around. So um, so I started building out this map to help, um, you know, other reporters, just readers, anybody, the public um, start to make sense of this issue. And over time, um, it, it became, a, you know, a really comprehensive project. And, and I was drawing that data from mostly publicly available sources. So it was really dependent on 
um, you know, states dashboards, COVID dashboards, um, and, you know, some unions that were collecting this data, um, some FOIA requests and some other efforts, but for the most part, publicly reported data. And one of the things I learned along the way was that um, there was not great reporting going on from the government um, or certainly from the private sector on the number of workers who were contracting COVID, um, you know, at, at any point in the pandemic, even this most acute period, which you know was the first few months of the pandemic in 2020. And there was, you know, reporting has has come out in you know the past year or so, mostly from local outlets. Um, showing that you know business interests, chambers of commerce, um, specific companies were were putting a foot on that um, scale and and attempting to keep information about workers contracting COVID at their facilities private. And there were various reasons given for that effort, but the consequence was that um, especially as the pandemic kind of wore onto its second year, sources of information about worker illness um, were depleting, and. Uh, Eventually, the project wrapped up in September when I left for Reuters, and also at the time, um, so September 2021, um, there were very few states that were still reporting um, with any regularity outbreaks of COVID at, at food manufacturing um, plants and meatpacking plants. Um, and so, so I think you know the um, the big takeaway from that project was that this this was a sector that you know what Suzanne said earlier so resonant about. The issues that were facing food system workers during COVID were, it were COVID was exacerbating pre-existing workplace conditions that um, led to an easy transmission of a virus. And um, there's also been some great reporting about how um, particularly the meat industry had been warned uh, and actually directed by the federal government to prepare for a pandemic-like um, scenario and, and never did. Um, and as a result, was was very slow to respond to equip workers with protective gear and, and basically every step of the way. Um, it took a long time for for workers in that sector to have basic protections. So, um, so I think the 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 lesson was that um, you know this is a sector that's particularly vulnerable for all the reasons that have been discussed, um, and there was you know massive interest and desire to know this information, but it wasn't uh, being released either by um, by the federal government or state governments um, or the private sector. Thanks, Leah. Yeah, I, I remember. The, at the the height of your reporting on this, and I see in the chat, Kira put in the uh, the link. If you all, if you hadn't seen uh, Leah's reporting and want to see it, you can click through that link to see it. But I remember following your work and just being like, "How is this not? How is Leah? I mean, not to. I mean, of course, you're amazing, but it's like, how is there not like 50 people, you know, covering this like critical issue? How is this not like publicly mandated, demanded from these companies? You know, the the kind of the legwork that you had to do, Leah, to get this information was again, as just like I said earlier, the fact that Leah, you all had to fight to get access to restrooms, right? These are these things that um, might seem common sense and seem like basic fundamental rights that we should have in terms of transparency from these companies or protections for workers that we don't have. And that's why we need groups like Worker Justice Project, the Food Chain Workers, and that's why we need reporters like you, Leah. Um, so Suzanne, on that note, let's turn it over to you uh, next to talk about uh, uh, you know, in this context of this crisis around COVID, as you really w put it so well at the top of this conversation, clearly exacerbating what we already knew was so um, fundamentally flawed in our economic system as it pertains to um, justice for food workers. Uh, what kinds of openings do you feel you were able to exploit and take advantage of in this moment? Uh, and what do you feel like were some of the biggest victories that the Food Chain Workers Alliance was able to secure for its members collectively in this moment? Um, I'd love for you to share that. As you're thinking about what you want to share, a reminder to all of you uh, listening uh, to be thinking about questions you have anytime, drop them into the Q&A. We have about another 15, 20 minutes uh, for the questions I'll be raising for the these um, uh, our speakers today, and then we'll come to your questions. So be thinking about them or adding them in, and uh, let me turn it over to you, Suzanne. Um, yeah, so I think that um, Kira uh, earlier shared in the chat a link to a report that we published uh, called um, We Are Not Disposable uh, Food Workers on the COVID Front Lines, and um, that kind of you know, laid out a lot of the impacts that we were seeing in the, in the various food sectors, um, you know, after talking to our members. Um, and, 
you know, at that time, you know, there was a real opening for, for the larger public that was finally looking at what was going on in food labor. It was an opening to say yes and let us tell you a little bit more about those root causes um, and how you can kind of be involved um, in, in making sure that these essential workers are protected. Um, and, you know, and so, you know, we offered various opportunities for the larger public and allies to participate in, in, in that, um, taking the direction from our members. Uh, but I think what this report really outlined was that, you know, workers who, um, were able to stay the most protected despite the precariousness of their situation of having to work under COVID were those that were organized, right? Um, uh, either as union or non-union. Um, and, you know, it was sort of a story uh, that helped us like reiterate the message that we need to do what we can to support the right uh, for uh, workers to organize themselves. Um, and, what we also saw, and we relied a great deal on uh, Leia's reporting, and we were actually quite grateful for it. Um, and, you know, we saw a lot of activity um, coming from our members who are working in the meat and poultry industry. And, you know, we were able to engage with allies in the larger food justice movement to help to sort of um, rise rise some challenges to the uh, meat industry, like our um, civil rights lawsuit, for example, um, and against Tyson and and, um, and our, our member Rural Community Workers Alliance in Missouri, who sued Smithfield, but then also kind of using those tools to help to, to bring more attention to what was happening in that industry, um, which then uh, was correlated with our attempts to get um, COVID health and safety standards, you know, passed under OSHA, uh, which did not succeed. But it, but the, the the process of of sort of launching that campaign really helped to bring more attention uh, to what was happening in the meat industry. And, and most recently, we've been part of a coalition um, that's just introduced the um, Protect America's. Meat Processing Workers Act, uh, which a lot of uh, our, our members and, and workers helped inform the language of. Um, and so, you know, in, in that's sort of an example of some of the kind of policy-based work that we try to do over time, right? Uh, and I think one success I would say is that, you know, we were able to push back on the passage of the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. I mean, it was probably not just us, uh, but we, but our farm worker members uh, were able to r really sort of um, build a, an important sort of like public campaign ab about uh, the dangers of a policy like that in terms of the rights of farm workers, uh, which, you know, we think that, you know, other allies of ours, you know, didn't agree with, but at least, you know, respected uh, our analysis and our campaign. Um, and similarly, you know, we've been for a long period of time involved in this uh, national movement for good food public procurement. Um, and what we are on the cusp of is the passage of the first state bill, uh, which essentially will give the opportunity for cities and counties to say that we're not going to public to you know um, purchase food with public dollars from vendors who violate the right to organize or violate workers' rights, among among other things. And so those are all sort of really important pieces of ongoing work that we see as victories. But I think that, you know, if you, you know, sign up for our newsletter, if you look at our website from time to time, you'll see the more important victories, which is that of our members, right? And, you know, I think that as far as the alliance, I think the most important victory, I would say, is that despite the, the difficulties and the challenges of the past couple of years, our mem we're, we're a member-based organization and our member engagement has never been stronger, has never been higher. Our, you know, the, the space in which our members come together across sectors and cross geographies to talk together about, you know, strategies and, and collective organizing is, is stronger than ever. Um, and, you know, that has 
led to uh, our members help, you know, uh, making the decision to sort of uh, direct the work of the Alliance towards really focusing on helping to build the infrastructure of the food worker movement. And, um, and that has, you know, multiple levels, you know, from um, supporting, uh, you know, funding opportunities for our members, um, as well as supporting, you know, supporting them with really sort of basic tools like communications and research. Um, and also, you know, the expansion of our programs to really uh, give support to worker leaders and, and uh, local organizers uh, to be able to, you know, uh, win victories on a local level in, in, in their workplaces. And, um, you know, we're very excited to sort of see that mission through in the future. Thanks, Suzanne. You know, I've been, you know, following the work of the Food Chain Workers Alliance for a very long time and folks at uh, Real Food Media uh, have been working with Food Chain Workers Alliance and many others on your on the good food purchasing work you've been talking about. And one of the things that I've always found so powerful about your work is exactly what you were talking about there at the end about what the, the, the power that comes from bringing together worker member organizations across the food chain from folks that are working at the farm field all the way to grocery retail or restaurants or delivery workers and to be able to, uh, as the theme of this uh, webinar is all about, to be able to really express and feel and uh, mobilize around that shared sense of solidarity. So uh, thanks for that, Suzanne. So I want to turn it over to you, Lihia, to, to uh, continue uh, the, the conversation about what your organizing has looked like in this moment. I know during our prep call, you talked about uh, a kind of um, energy and, and uh, positive response you've gotten from uh, everyday eaters, from, from consumers in uh, the communities in which you're organizing. And I want to just have you share a little bit more about what you're seeing in terms of the popular sentiment on the ground in the communities where you're organizing for the kind of solidarity work that you're mobilizing around. And you know, any other kind of top highlight of uh, a, a big success or win your organization uh, has um, has had. Thanks. So, yeah, I think, you know, one of the most, I think, powerful things about Los Deliberistas Unidos is about the ability of connecting and building solidarity across sectors, right? Um, the Deliberistas are interconnected across different sectors, whether it's transportation, um, the food, um, building an equitable food ecosystem, right, for the communities um, is connected um, with um, like the infrastructure, right, bike lane infrastructure for the city um, to make sure that it's more equitable to all communities um, as well. So, um, and, and also with the small business economy, right, like there is a huge economy that relies on food delivery workers in order to keep their businesses open, right? And, and they were vital to the local economy. So one of the things of um, LDU and the organizing we're doing on Worker Justice that is to be able to connect that these are core, that there is core interconnection issues that would allow the movement to move forward and be empowered um, and to ensure that there is an interconnection, that there is solidarity. So we are building solidarity with the transportation groups um, to make sure that um, we fight for the same things. There was an equitable transportation system. We're fighting for the, we're, we're building a equitable um, um, transportation system uh, for all New Yorkers, right? But at the same time, we wanna be able to um, build in solidarity with the small restaurants, local economy, right? Make sure that these apps are not taking advantage, right? When we passed the legislation, it was like super historic and unique to see how the small restaurant um, associations, right? Were actually supportive of the Bill of Rights of, uh, I mean, the, the this whole set of rights for Los Deliberistas um, from New York, right? That was a level of solidarity. That was like unique to see um, the small business restaurants and the associations come together and say like, yes, they're vital. They're part of our, our economy. They're essential to our industry, right? Um, and, and, and also getting the support of consumers because at the end of the day, uh, consumers are the ones who are taking advantage as well, right? They're overcharged. There's over fees, um, and some of these fees don't even go to the to 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 pay the operating cost of the restaurants nor the workers. So we have been able to find common 
um, um, issues that has allowed us to work together and continue to build solidarity. So we're right now part of our organizing work for the next next two, three years is about how we continue to partner and expand this uh, partnership with transportation groups to build a real infrastructure, um, transportation infrastructure that addresses the needs, not only um, of people who own cars, but people who ride bikes um, um, to make it safer for communities to ride and walk. Um, we're partnering with, with the small businesses as well to make sure that there is a fair code of understanding of how valuable um, delivery workers are to their economy, right? And there needs to be not only shared solidarity agreements, but um, how we can continue to expand that solidarity to make sure that we can hold the big tech apps accountable, right? And, and most importantly, we want to make sure that these jobs become profet- like more dignified jobs, right, for our communities, because most of the communities who rely on food delivery work happens to be... Um, Um, brown, black uh, New Yorkers who live in low-income communities. Um, And we're committed um, and and ready to redesign the infrastructure of our city, um, um, continue to um, expand protections uh, beyond the six um, labor rights that we were able to secure. Um, We're ready to build a new Deliverista hub model um, for 65,000 Deliveristas who are across the country. Um, But most importantly, as as I said before, um, to determine determine what the future of this work looks like for Black, Brown people who are feeding New Yorkers, who are essential to our economy, um, um, and, and who right now more than ever are workers who deserve protections because they they are not only human beings, they're essential workers. They're essential to our city's recovery. Thanks for all of that and all the incredible work. And I loved all of your examples of the, the, um, connections of solidarity that you're you're helping to strengthen, helping to expose and share and uh, manifest. So really exciting to hear. So I want to turn it over to a last question to you, Leah. We are about to open it up to your questions. Uh, uh, anybody tuning in, so be sure to use your Q and A function at the bottom of your screen to uh, put in the question you'd like me to raise to our panelists. Uh, but um, I'll turn it over to you, Leah, to uh, have you share uh, what. Um, you know, we we had you share with us this incredible investigative reporting work you did, incredible body of work you helped to uh, to create. And I'm curious, what policy changes, if any, <laughs> uh, do you feel came from that? And I know you're a journalist, so you're not in the business of like prescribing things. But um, uh, you know, if you can take off your journalism hat for a moment, you know, were there policy changes that? felt like so obviously um, would be so needed in, in response to the kinds of um, issues that you uncovered in your reporting uh, about uh, the workers that you were chronicling and meatpacking plants in particular, uh, but just wanted to, to give you that chance to either yeah, share if there were policies that emerged or policies that should have uh, emerged, uh, if you're willing to, to project uh, such a, a um, uh, share such a thought with us. And then again, use the Q&A feature for um, any questions you all have so Leah yeah I mean you know it's every journalist's dream to to have policy change come uh from their work um you know I think the biggest outcome at a national level from the work was um an open investigation that's still going on by um the federal government the house uh, subcommittee on the coronavirus crisis um which has uh began hmm, uh, I'm going to say last fall, um, and it's still ongoing, but one of their first efforts was to subpoena, um, or not subpoena, but request information from um, meatpacking companies, the top meatpacking companies for their internal data on worker illness. Um, and it's sort of my, my, my response is kind of an answer to both of your questions, because, you know, my my strong belief around this project was always that the, the number one thing that we needed was more information, and the information was was somewhere um, someone knew the answer to how many workers were getting sick at a given facility, um, whether it was being aggregated or not. There was some some way to access that information, and and I eventually, you know, hit a wall where I couldn't access anymore. Um, but the federal government has power, and and the House subcommittee has used that the powers that they have to to get that information. And and their initial 
uh, release of um, of uh, worker illnesses and deaths at the top meatpacking companies um, showed that there were about three times, I think it was about three times more um, cases and deaths among workers there than I had been able um, to count on my own, um, which again, you know, definitely validated my instinct that um, these companies had been tracking this information and refused to release it um, as part of, uh, you know, working with the media or working with public health departments, um, but we're, we're going to release it to the government. Um, and, and that investigation, as I said, is still ongoing. I'm not sure the status. Um, so I think that that, you know, that piece allows us to have so much more knowledge of what was going on that, you know, the time frame of the information they requested is limited. It's not the full pandemic. Obviously this issue is, is still an issue. Um, but at least gives a window into what um, what the you know what was actually going on and and my you know my hope going forward is that you know if that there's been lessons learned about the the role of um, you know funding public health departments to actually collect and aggregate this information so that there's a public um, non private sector source of information that you know workers can access journalists can access and everyone can understand you know how a crisis like this is affecting their community. Great. Just a quick follow-up, Leah, for those who haven't uh, read your reporting on this, do you want to just share a bit of the facts and figures, like how many, what were you finding in terms of sickness and um, deaths and how that was, um, you know, different from or similar to what you were seeing in other uh, industries? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I had to, um, I used to have these numbers. I know. I was like, I'm going to ask her this question, but (laughs) no, I wrote it down. I don't know if you, yeah. (laughs) Um, cause yeah, I, I, it's been a couple of months now. Um, but yeah, during the course of the project, which went from April, 2020 to September, 2021, I counted about 92,000, um, COVID cases and 466 deaths, um, among you know, meatpacking workers, food processing workers, and farm workers. Um, probably the sector that was least represented in that count is farm workers. It was always the sector that was hardest to get information about. Um, you know, poorly served community in terms of access to testing um, and just public health services in general. So I would say that that is it's all absolutely an undercount. Um, but that was what I was able to cobble together. Um, and yeah, I also was keeping track of where those outbreaks happened, and so. Um, or where those cases were were occurring. So, and, and I think these numbers are, you know, pretty staggering. The, you know, those cases and deaths happened at, I have 581 meatpacking plants, um, 885 food processing plants and 438 farms. So, I mean, it's it's just big numbers when you say it like that, but I mean, the scope and the region is in every state. Um, and again, if folks want to see that visualized, which is I think the easiest way to consume that information, it's, it's all at that link in the chat. Great. Thank you, Leah. And for those of you who aren't familiar with those numbers, you know, it's staggering every time I hear them, staggering in terms of the cost to human um, life uh, and staggering in terms of um, the amount of work that that must have meant for you, for you Leah, as well. Um, so we're turning it over uh, uh, to questions from all of you uh, tuning in by phone or watching us on video. I love this question that just came in. So uh, I'm going to have each of you respond to it. The question is, what are some strategies strategies you've used to turn folks who work outside of the food chain into allies and accomplices. Uh, so who, who wants to jump in first? Leah, yeah, can I call on you? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I feel like uh, this is, this is uh, yeah. one of your, uh, you know, secret weapons. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm just going to be honest and transparent. I think COVID helped a lot <laughs> on building this, um, these strategies of solidarity across um, groups who traditionally don't organize um, workers in the food industry nor um, workers in general, right? Um, that was key. I think um, COVID kind of, um, um, you know, kind of brought to light what has been happening, right? That um, food delivery work are is slavery um, work pretty much, right? Um, they are not entitled to a minimum wage. They're, they mostly dependent on tips, right? Um, they're relying on bikes to do this work. They were essential during COVID. Um, they were unsung heroes for doing the economy that helped a lot, I think, to build, um, understanding of how important and valuable this workforce is for New York city. I think that that was key uh, for us to um, to ensure that people understand that these are not just workers. These are essential frontline workers that kept New Yorkers fed, 
that kept everybody safe, right? Um, and that was, I think, the most important weapon um, to start interconnecting with other movements. Um, um, and we kind of find ways to connect based on 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 the issues, finding common issues that. Um, other people care, right? In the transportation industry, I mean, in the transportation sector, transportation groups care about safety, um, right? But so deliveristas, because um, their work are actually on the streets. They care as much as safety as the transportation groups, right? And, and sometimes transportation is looked as a people with privilege who will fight for it, right? But no. Um, so we found we found those common issues and, and common concerns and things that people will wanna fight within the movement, right? Um, about the environment, you know, there's a whole movement about how moving the city to more greener, cleaner um, ecosystem, right? Uh, and deliveristas are doing exactly that, right? They're they're using e-bikes as a way to transport food to keep New Yorkers fed, to keep the small business economy and restaurants running. Um, and it is important for them that there is an infrastructure, that there is safer bike lanes, um, that there is more e-bike charging stations, right? And they want to promote the use of e-bikes um, on the streets. And, and it was an easy click for many of the environmental groups who said, you know, this is a no-brainer and we're going to be supporting deliveristas who are vital to our economy, right? And for the restaurant industry, as the same, we found common issues and, and, and things that they wanted to fight together. Um, for the restaurants industry, it was easier because workers and restaurants were being ripped off by multi-billion dollar tech companies, right? They were being overcharged fees to the restaurants. They were not paying workers. Um, there was a lack of transparency. Um, and we brought those groups together, right? Um, I just have to be honest, a lot, the strategy we use was about education, finding that commonality um, and making sure we talked about those issues, right? And make sure that we bring these communities to not only talk to each other, um, but understand the value that they bring to the whole ecosystem of our city, how we can make our cities thrive, how we can recover from one of the worst crises of our time um, and to truly understand that at the end of the day, we're all New Yorkers. Doesn't matter whether you're brown, black, um, immigrant, non-immigrant, we're all part of the recovery. We all want to get better at making sure that our cities are safe, um, that people who feed, um, who keep us fed every day have dignified, dignified rights because that's vital to, that, that's vital to our economic recovery. Uh, we want to keep our restaurants thriving, right? So really finding ways of building solidarity, having that common, honest conversation and finding ways to work together. Love it. I love all those examples. Suzanne uh, or Leah, do you want to jump in uh, and add some thoughts? And I think for you, Leah, this applies a bit differently, but I think it's similarly as the kind of a, a, a reframe as a reporter is what are the strategies you, you use as a reporter to uh, get the interest of and, and really be able to reach and speak to the policymakers or corporate leaders or those who who's who um, who you're reporting, uh, who should be informed by your reporting. Um, so Suzanne, do you wanna add anything and then I'll turn it over to Leah? Yeah, I mean, I I agree with um, Leah in that, um, you know, COVID was an opportunity to uplift uh, the food worker narrative in many ways. Um, and, you know, education certainly is a big part of it. And, you know, there is this, one strategy that we often turn to, which is, um, which Lihia also mentioned, what was, is that of the consumer of that who has uh, the purchasing power, right? Um, and that, you know, that is a tactic. I think that's, that's a tactic that like supports particular um, actions or campaigns that have uh, certain goals. And I think, you know, we've seen it used uh, multiple times and it's been very, very useful, um, you know, and so it's consumers and then just other sort of interested members of the public who, um, you know, support, who want to see workers protected, right? Or, um, and, you know, want to support efforts by retweeting what we might post, have posted or, or, or signing a petition. And, and that continues to sort of be important. And that's sort of a constant tactic that we're using. I think the question is interesting because it says, 
ally and accomplice, right? So I think accomplice kind of takes it to like another level, right? Because sometimes what we often see too is that, you know, sometimes like a, a worker campaign will start with something on social media or some education or some firing, but then, you know, a lot of the victories that we've seen with our members, like, Burgerville winning the first uh, collective bargaining agreement in, in, the, in the history of the fast food industry in the U.S., or the tulip workers in Washington state, you know, just winning their demands after going on strike um, very quickly, I might add. You know, that me, you know, a comp, an accomplice in that situation is bodies on the ground, <laughs> you know, um, and also kind of you know, uh, following those campaigns, like, you know, not just like when they're asking you to sign up for a position, but get to know the organization in, in, in your city, like New York City, or get to know the organization in your locality and, um, and you know, and figure out the time when you can um, sign their petition and figure out a time where you can actually, like, you know, um, show up. Like you know, and uh, in, in 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 more of, of uh, sort of the accomplice role, um, and all of that is really really important. Yeah, I love that, um, and I love that distinction or that that kind of level up from uh, from ally to accomplice. I'm putting into the chat this link to this documentary I mentioned to the three of you before. For those of you um, tuning in uh, by phone uh, who might not be on the chat, it's called Union Time, and it's uh, a documentary you can see for free through the public libraries um, online. Uh, database, but one of the things that you see in this documentary, it's a story of organizing at a Smithfield meatpacking plant in Tar Heel, North Carolina, but one of the elements of it you made me think about, Suzanne, was how they mobilized accomplices, how they mobilized the community, religious community uh, in particular, but they mobilized them and how people in solidarity with the food workers were really vital in uh, going, hitting the ground, hitting the streets, you know, demonstrating in front of uh, the Smithfield shareholder meeting, for instance, and what a difference that made for their campaign. So uh, uh, if you want to watch an inspiring documentary, it also really shows just how hard it is to organize in the United States. Uh, but it's a, a great documentary. Um, so Leah, I want to come to you again. This is a bit of a different question kind of with your reporter hat on, but I am curious, actually, if you uh, feel like there's a way in which you also kind of are strategic in how you uh, use your reporting to um, um, to reach uh, folks who really should be hearing it and reading it. Yeah, I mean, the question really made me think about um, how having hard data on this issue made such a big difference in terms of what journalists are able to accomplish with the messaging, because I think there's, it was just, it just added, I think, a backbone or a, something concrete for readers to have. Um, and in terms of like, building awareness around these issues, it made me think about working with other reporters as I was going through this reporting project. And, and I really made an effort to, especially with reporters who are at local outlets, regional outlets, to, you know, give, you know, here's the data for your state, if you want a specific sector to just be able to be really generous with that information and help other reporters, you know, do their work in a state where they were having similar issues that I was, you know, getting information. So, having um, some ready-made, you know, data went a long way. And I think that partnership, whether it was over email or Twitter DM or phone call, you know, it was a really a great opportunity for community building among, among media outlets who were interested in this issue and knew that it was important to the communities that we all serve, but we're all facing um, really high barriers to getting, to getting that information in the first place. So I think having those concrete numbers and, and, you know, building those partnerships went a long way to reaching the audience. That's awesome. I love that journalist to journalist solidarity. Uh, so another question that came in um, uh, to, to you all is uh, really interesting. And, and again, I think it's there's a way this applies to you, Leah, in a slightly different way. But the question is, um, are there things that you all have learned from the way these issues are handled in other countries uh, that um, you, you, you've uncovered that either in your case, Leah, Suzanne brought into your organizing work uh, that you've been doing either in New York City or nationally, Suzanne? And then for me, the question kind of for you, Leah, would be, um, are there things that you've seen in how this information was reported or treated or, or policies and frameworks from other countries that are a real 
um, counterpoint to how we've managed uh, this crisis here in um, the U.S. Um, so, uh, Leah, do you want to jump in first or Suzanne on this? Uh, and then we'll come to you, Leah, on, again, things that you are seeing in other countries, way uh, maybe lessons learned or even, you know, uh, global solidarity uh, that you want to uh, uh, share with us. Well, I, I think for us specifically, we've been um, talking to the um, delivery workers in Mexico as well. Um, I think it's important for people. I think we all know like app, del app food delivery has become um, a worldwide um, um, economy, um, right? These are like, you know, multi uh, international corporations that are everywhere and expanding. Um, and it is important to um, connect, especially um, Los Deliveristas Unidos with other um, delivery workers across the world. So we started building solidarity with workers in Mexico um, who are experiencing the same issues, right? Um, it's funny, um, one of our members mentioned that um, he spoke to some of the leaders and was on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a on a call with some of their leaders who were organizing and trying to organize, experiencing the same issues, lack of transparency, safety, um, the fact that there is discrepancy on their payments, um, the, 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 there is a lot of um, common issues that they're faced because their bosses happens to be the same. There happens to be using the same tactics, right? Um, and with, with this, these big tech companies, it is important um, to start building those connections. So there is a deep commitment from LDU, not only to be building an organizing example that it is possible and inspire all the workers that it is possible to organize, it is possible to rewrite the rules of the gig work, right? It is possible to win worker representation, which is what they want. Um, and we and Los Deliveristas wanna keep learning and inspiring as well other workers. Um, and as we know, uh, one the reason we started doing more of that is because we're, we're seeing how these um, gig companies are expanding their markets, right? Grubhub is a one example, was recently purchased by a European gig company, right? Pretty much, um, Grubhub is run by outsider, right? An international company in Europe. Um, and that's just an example that if corporations are expanding globally their markets, that means like exploitation is expanding, right? Um, the working, the unsafe um, and undignified working conditions are, are the same um, across um, the country, across the nations, across, across the globe. Um, so learning solidarity, um, it is critical um, to movement building. Um, and we're committed to do that, to learn and inspire, um, to transform um, food delivery work in a, in a profession that dignifies people's lives. Thank you so much. Uh, Suzanne, do you want to jump in with some thoughts to this question too? Sure. Um, so, you know, uh, we actually have two member organizations in Canada, in, in Quebec and in Toronto, and um, and that, you know, th that's international, first and foremost. And, um, you know, we actually, uh, in, in late 2020, there were a group of uh, workers at a greenhouse in Ontario uh, that went on strike to protest COVID conditions. Um, and, we were able to organize uh, actions at 20 Starbucks in the United States where they sold the products that were grown in, in this greenhouse. And, um, and that was that was significant in, in that uh, it, it kind of mirrors the kind of solidarity that we're trying to build, right? Um, nationally and you know, um, you know, across uh, nations. And, you know, it, it's really interesting to see when we have our trainings and webinars or, um, you know, members from the Quebec Union that are, are talking about how much they have succeeded in organizing restaurant workers when that's been such a challenge in the United States. And then we also have one of our member organizations, uh, Grassroots Labor Justice, who's uh, um, who have been organizing in many places, including with uh, melon uh, growers in Honduras. And um, you know, and so we, you know, and we have also you know um, networks in Latin America and um, in other places. Like we actually are 
you know, every May Day, we do an internal meeting with our members, uh, with allies from other countries. And this year, we're hoping actually that dairy workers from South Africa are going to be joining us. Um, and, but you know, what we're realizing, though, is that uh, I think, you know, first of all, we talk about the food industry. There are so many sectors and they all differ, right? Um, you know, if there's warehouse, there's agriculture, there, you know, restaurant. And um, and I think that, you know, there, there's certainly when these workers come together, it's really important for us to build the space for the workers to come together from different countries to talk as opposed to the organizers. And there are a lot of similarities, but there's also always a very specific political context or economic context in which things are, are existing. But, in, um, you know, agricultural work looks different in global South countries, for example, right, than they do uh, in countries like the U.S. or in Europe. And, um, and you know, warehousing. And, you know, but we're seeing a lot of opportunities particularly as more of our members are organizing campaigns against multinational companies, whether they be um, uh, like uh, like different sort of like warehouse kind of conglomerates or, um, you know, food conglomerates like um, and, you know, we're using those networks to look for opportunities for cross border solidarity. Um, and it, it takes time to do that because, like Leia said, we need the information. <laughs> And and we need the ability to then utilize that information to create that. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, but I think just in the way that, you know, we bring workers from different parts of the U.S. together to talk, you know, we it's important to also do that internationally, because I think that there's a lot that can be learned uh, from, you know, the challenges and the victories that workers have had in, in different places. But it, it's just, it's hard to sort of um, summarize uh, because some because the context can be so different. Right, completely. Leah, do you want to jump in here? Again, it's kind of a different question with your reporter hat on, but about things you learned in your reporting process uh, from other countries, kind of contrast to how we do things here. Anything you want to share? Yeah, um, you know, I don't, I don't have a great answer to this question. I think it's a really good one. Um, you know, I definitely learned that there were outbreaks like this all over the world. You know, that there, you know, I think probably the most analogous um, situation to what was happening, like in the U.S. meatpacking sector, was the Canadian meatpacking sector, where there was very similar. And and Suzanne mentioned um, greenhouses. You know, there were very similar, um, you know, types of food processing where workers are in close proximity. In a confined space that that you know was made it very easy for the virus to spread and um and you know it's it, there were cases where or specific outbreaks where it, you know in those um, instances the government responded to you know close down those facilities right away and there was a government action to intervene in the way that um we had you know a, a sometimes here but it, you know um ended relatively soon in the pandemic um but you know, I haven't done a more systemic review than that, um, other than to say that you know this there there are definitely aspects to how the food processing sector in the U.S. is shaped and operates that made this COVID experience unique. And then also to say that there were similar outbreaks happening um, in other countries as well. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Well, so we're coming to the end of our time together, and I just want to give my immense thanks to the three of you for joining us. And I have one final question, and we'll start with you, Leah, um, then come to you, Leah, then you, Suzanne. And, and it is, you know, coming back to this theme of the conversation, which I feel like all three of you have touched on in so many different ways, but this theme of solidarity. I'd love us to think about having, think about a moment and, and you listening, think about a moment uh, uh, when you've, you've seen or felt experienced the kinds of solidarity expressions that the three of you have talked about. And so what was coming up for me as I was thinking about this question is this story I tell sometimes about a, a consumer co-op that I reported on in South Korea. And uh, its leaders told me, uh, kind of jokingly told me that they have a, an inside joke at the consumer co-op where every year at their annual meeting, the annual meeting they, they were telling me always ends in a huge fight. And they were kind of smiling about it. So they knew that I, I knew they meant a friendly fight. Um, and what they say is that at this annual meeting, 
happening between the consumer member representatives and the farmer member representatives of this consumer co-op, the fight is about what uh, that they always deliberate on the prices for food within the membership. And the fight is uh, over the most important food in this uh, co-op, which is the price of rice. And the farmers are always fighting to charge more and the consumer representatives are always uh, fighting to charge less. And they're explaining it from the sense of solidarity that, or sorry, the other way around. So the farmer is saying, you know, we don't want you consumers to have to pay so much because we care about your livelihoods. We care about you being able to feed your families. And the consumer representatives are like, we want to pay you more because we care about you as farmers and we want you to be able to be sustainable. And it's just this moment of solidarity that I love reflecting on and I love sharing because we have this illusion, I think, in our capitalist economy that always consumers and producers are at odds. And always the consumer just wants to pay the cheapest and always the producer always wants to get the most. And that there's this moment when you put those people together to really see their shared solidarity, the conversation will really be different. And um, so that popped into my head as I thought about this question. Uh, but if each of you just want to share, we only have a few minutes left. You know, is there a specific moment, you know, Leah, in your reporting where you really felt that sense of solidarity? Um, Leah, you know, you shared so many already, but, it, you know, another specific moment where that feeling of solidarity rippled through your body. Uh, again, Suzanne, your whole alliance is all about <laughs> solidarity across the food chain. But again, one story that you, you know, that you kind of circle back to um, if you'd want to share that. So we'll start with you, Leah. Sure. I, I, you know, I think one of my most powerful experiences was towards the end of this reporting project where I was reporting on a, a union drive um, at a frozen vegetable processing plant in Eastern Washington State. Um, when Eastern Washington State has a whole agricultural region that was really, um, really hit by COVID. And um, it was, you know, both Suzanne and Lee have talked about, um, you know, the impact of COVID on organizing and, and I've done some reporting on that in, in the food sector. And, you know, I, I was able to sit in and speak with um, the organizing committee of this um, union when they were a few months into their um, union drive and they've actually since uh, ratified a contract. So very successful effort. Um, and just to hear them talking about, you know, this, um, how the experiences that they had during COVID really um, amplified um, the it really drew everyone in the workplace together around issues that they'd each maybe grappled with separately, but in this moment felt like they they needed to come together around it. And um, they had used some of the the database that I had put together to to you know build sort of a, a backbone to talk to people about, um, which was super powerful for me. And and I think just it really um, it really uh, highlighted you know why I had been doing this work and and what the utility of it was to the communities that were were drawing on it. Thanks for sharing that. Lihia, we'll come to you next. Yeah. Um, well, there's, I think with, I mean, it's just, it's a fresh thing. There's so, been so many moments of, of, of solidarity that I think is just transformative to workers in general. Right. Um, I think one specific experience that um, for workers who have shared, right. Like I, I remember when they, they came out, um, one of the first reporting um, came out from the city and two incredible reporters, uh, Claudia and Josefa, um, kind of highlighting the movement that Los Deliberistas built, right? And for the first time, any readers kind of reading it, right? Um, for the first time, understanding the value of Deliberistas, um, who were they, why they were essential, right? It kind of, and I remember that one of the, one of the one of the things that um, workers wanted it from consumers wasn't even asking about giving more tips, right? Was more about just help us hold, create more transparency. Just disclose your receipt to us, right? Um, and just so we know how much tip you gave um, and how much money we will end up get paid. That's what workers were asking, um, right? When when we first started um, organizing, because the big issue was more transparency, right? And I remember that as soon as that report, uh, that 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 news came out, um, workers started calling me um, like crazy. They were saying like, listen, I, I just started seeing tips of $100, $200. Um, and they were like so nervous. And they were saying, I don't want consumers to feel that we're begging them to give us more money, right? I don't want them to feel 
that we're asking them to pay more than when already paid because we understand that it, it's not them, it's the apps who are charging, right? So the consumer ends up paying a lot because the app is charging and they understand very well. These are like smart, brilliant workforce. They understand that the consumer gets charged a fee for the restaurant, gets charged extra fees for delivery that it's kept by the companies, right? So they understand that. And there was this level of concern of like, why all of the sudden, right after this, like reporting people are giving larger tips, right? And, and they were like saying, we don't, we don't want people to overpay. Um, and, and really like um, community members um, and people responding um, to their messages and of um, saying that, you know, this is a way of recognizing your labor, right? If the apps, if nobody's going to recognize you, this is a, a way for me to say thank you, right? And I remember that was like a hot moment for workers understanding that, wow, consumers are our allies. They, they, there are consumers that respect us, um, that would value us, um, and that we, we're in it to fight together to make this work more safer and dignified. And, and that was like, I think, a beautiful moment for, for workers and consumers to understand that they're in it together, right? There's much, um, there is much work to do, right? To highlight uh, what workers want, what consumers and the issues that they're facing. But that was like a, an interesting moment, right, for for me as an organizer, and I think workers as well trying to understand, like, we're not begging <laughs> you to give me more. Um, uh, we we just want you to help us create more transparency. Um, but understanding that they, you know, there is a level of working together in in way of recognizing them, and that that was it, right? I love that. Oh, thanks for sharing that. So we have uh, just a couple of minutes left, Suzanne. Do you want to add a? Uh, uh, moment of solidarity again i know you experience them on a daily basis <laughs> um you know i think I, I would just say like last night actually we had uh one of our um sessions of uh what we're calling our, our member organizing fellowship program uh which we, we began um late last year where um you know we have uh leaders and organizers from our member-based organizations who come together to um, exchange uh, strategies and thoughts to, to, to help support organizing projects that they have. And, um, a, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what happens there is that leaders from other member organizations come and, you know, take their time to, um, you know, offer their time to uh, help kind of offer suggestions about how to improve tactics. And, um, and uh, for example, like one of the sessions that we had was a, a worker leader from Laundry Worker Center who, you know, you know Kate spent a long time on the call with us one evening, just talking uh, with members of the program about how they've been able to do one-on-one -on -one conversations with workers who um, are often scared to talk about uh, the prospect of unionizing their workplace. And then last night we had two uh, workers who grow tulips and daffodils who were part of this uh, successful uh, strike out in Washington state who took the time to come and, and talk about how, uh, you know, how they came to uh, winning their demands. Um, and, you know, on the call, we had a, somebody organizing in the warehouse industry in Chicago, in the restaurant industry in DC, a guest worker from Toronto and a food processing worker from Cincinnati. And just, you know, being part of that is incredible show of solidarity. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. I love love hearing all that. Well, thank you three so much. I know I speak on behalf of everybody who tuned in uh, to share my appreciation for your time, obviously today with us, but your time and all the work that uh, the three of you do. Uh, I also want to thank Tiffany Patton from Real Food Media, who's been live tweeting, to Maisie Richards, who's been capturing themes from this conversation to turn it into beautiful art we will share out with all of you. Uh, thanks to the New School for co-hosting this Roots of Resilience series. 
series with our team and to the West Marin Fund uh, who underwrote some of the costs for this program. All of you tuning in will get a link to this recording. Feel free to share it. Uh, again, uh, I really wanna thank the three of you. I've loved this conversation and I'm leaving it with a, a depth of a sense of solidarity even greater than I entered it with. So thank you three so much uh, and thanks to all the tech on the back end. And we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, Anna has said it all. So, well, thank you for joining us. Leah, Lihia, Suzanne, Anna, such a pleasure to have you here. Such a pleasure to work with Real Foods Media on this whole collaboration. It was fantastic. And uh, as Anna said, we'll have the recordings produced. You can find them on our website, tns.comwheel.org. Leah Douglas, Lihia Guapa, and Suzanne Adali, thank you for joining us at the New School at Common Wheel. See you next time. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. 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 River is a healer. The river is a sink. The river knows no end, and the river feels no way.